I, if it's a fork bomb you be wanting, it's a fork bomb you be getting. But before we detonate a couple, what the heck is a fork bomb? What does it do? Why is it called that? And how does it work? Well, long story short, it's an 11 character program that anybody can enter into any system, Windows, Linux, or Mac, that has the Bash shell. It will crash or render that computer inoperable within moments, even if you're not an administrator on the machine. Basically, you can ruin any system that hasn't had specific limits and protections configured in advance, and since they're not the default or not available, almost nobody does so. Once I demonstrate the carnage a fork bomb can cause, I'll also tell you how to protect your own systems, all today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and fork bombs are not actually a new phenomenon. In fact, diffusing them on a PDP-11 running Unix was one of my lab assignments back in college, which, suffice to say, was not exactly recent. Now, what does a fork bomb actually look like? Well, here it is, 11 characters, mostly punctuation, that will cripple most any computer. You can just enter them into the command line and boom, boom, out go the lights. Do not attempt this on any system that you do not own and don't do it anywhere that data loss could be a problem. I literally hooped the disk structure of my own machine just yesterday experimenting with a fork bomb while preparing for today's episode, so it's no joke. It can happen. I had a backup, but you may not. Who knows? It really can't be that easy, can it? Like 11 characters without admin rights? Especially if it's been known about for decades? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's head to the desktop and drop a fork bomb into the gears of both a Linux system and a Windows system to see how they fare. I also tested the Mac. More on that later. I'll be running Windows 11 and Ubuntu 20 on the same machine as peers of the same hypervisor. Without going into the weeds too far on the technical details of what that means, it generally means that both operating systems are the real deal. Each has access to the real hardware through the hypervisor and neither is a virtual machine. So the general results you see here today are the same ones you would get on a bare metal install of either operating system. Here you can see the Magic 11 characters. Again, they don't look like much. Sort of a nonsense C program, if anything. And yet, watch what happens if I type or paste those characters into the Linux command shell. Once I press enter, notice how the CPU usage in Task Manager begins to really spike. Now this is a 32-core Threadripper cranking away on all 64 of its threads, and yet it locks up almost immediately. I can no longer type into the active console window and it has stopped responding to new SSH logins, so I'm effectively at a dead end. If we cycle over to the instance of HTOP that I started in advance, it's being given enough cycles to repaint itself perhaps once every 20 seconds, but when it does, we can see that the cores are all pegged to about 100%. Linux is now hooped and I don't know an elegant way out of it at this point. The best solution is to use Windows to ask the supervisor up above to reset Linux for me, and I can do that with the WSL shutdown command. A minute or two later, and once the Linux subsystem has restarted itself, all is back to normal. Of course, any unsaved work was lost since there's no way to interact with the machine to save it. This begs a few questions, I think. First, how can Windows Task Manager report Linux's CPU use? Because it's just that good? Well, perhaps but what it's really reporting is the hardware CPU use at the hypervisor level. Normally, Windows would only report on its own CPU usage, not that of other hypervisor clients, but I'm guessing that special support has been added to Task Manager to somehow get that hardware information from the hypervisor itself. The next question is, would Windows itself fare any better? There's only one way to find out, of course, and you might rightly ask, but Dave, this requires Bash, and Windows doesn't include Bash. That much is true, but... Bash is widely and freely available. I've even got two different variants on my machine, one being the git bash shell and the other being the sigwin bash shell. And you can do this with command prompt, I'm just doing it with bash in order to make it orthogonal between all the machines to make it a fair comparison. But if you wanted to, you could certainly write a fork bomb using the CMD bash processor as well. I've tested both of the bash shells and the results are the same regardless of which bash you use. Total digital carnage. I simply type bash to launch that shell and I get the bash prompt where I can now enter the fork bomb expression. I'll copy and paste it because that's easier and as soon as I press enter, every CPU core jumps to 100% usage. At this point, I've lost the ability to type anything into the bash prompt, but it appears that I can go to another process like CMD and execute commands from there, which is promising. I first tried using the task kill command to try to terminate all of the bash instances, but I had very little luck. 
I decided to stop and save the video I was recording, the screen recording beforehand, but I ultimately used Task Manager's Recursive Kill on the CMD instance itself. Recursive Kill is not a feature I initially had in Task Manager. It was sort of a special request from our VP, Jim Altron, and now I'm glad he asked. On the Mac, it simply locked up as a spinning color wheel mouse that I could not move, and then a minute or so later, I got a pink screen and a reboot. Of the three operating systems I tested this on, Task Manager is the only way I was able to fully recover any of them. Perhaps you naturally wouldn't think of Windows as being the most resilient of the three, but here we are. The Mac was clearly unrecoverable, but if you have suggestions on how I could have recovered the Linux system properly, please let me know in the comments. I could not get a new console that allowed me to do anything productive, nor could I SSH into it, but perhaps using the HTOP instance that was already running, there was a way. Let me know. Now that we've seen the problems a fork bomb can cause, why is it called a fork bomb and how does it work? Well, let's take a look at the expression. It doesn't really matter if you understand this next little part, but I want to explain it for the truly curious. It looks a little like a C program, as I alluded to before, but that's because the bash script interpreter uses a very C-like syntax. What it's doing then is defining a function called A. A takes no parameters and hence the empty parentheses that come next. In between the curly braces is the function code itself. The first thing we find is again the letter A, which this time means it's calling A, so a function that calls itself. Well, that's just recursive, but the important part is what comes next, after the pipe symbol, another A, but this one followed by the ampersand, which indicates that it should be spun off as a parallel process. So the function does something critically important to the whole thing. It calls itself twice in parallel. Next, we find a semicolon which separates two statements. In this case, it separates our function definition from what comes next simply calling A one time. So this set of 11 characters defines a function and then calls it. Now, if we wanted to write this maybe a little more simply, we could write it as follows. A function named fork that calls itself and then pipes its output to a newly launched copy of itself. Once the function is defined on those first three lines, the fork call on line four lights the digital fuse. Anytime the function is called, it causes two more to be created before it exits. And so, each iteration causes the number of processes to double, and this exponential growth overwhelms the system resources no matter how much RAM or CPU you might have. It might take a second longer, but the results will be the same as we saw, a largely useless system. The whole process reminds me of sort of what happens in a nuclear fission reaction when it reaches critical mass. Enough of the neutrons being released ultimately collide with another particle and release more than one neutron on average. As a result, you get the famous chain reaction that causes a runaway growth in neutron production. Only in our case, instead of a cascade of neutrons, it's processes. The original fork bombs back in the 60s and 70s were known as rabbits, presumably for the fast rate at which they reproduced. Modern operating systems like Linux and Windows use copy-on-write schemes for memory management, which means that when multiple memory pages are truly duplicates of one another, only a single copy is kept and then each process just gets a reference to that page. It's only if a page gets modified, making it different than everybody else's copy, that a second copy is ever really made. As a result, fork bombs are not generally demanding of a lot of memory. Instead, they hog the CPU. They do this through two primary mechanisms. Through the sheer amount of CPU time taken by the act of creating new processes as fast as it possibly can, and by saturating the process table with so many processes that each process gets only a tiny slice of CPU time. Obviously by now it should go without saying, but do not do this on any machine that you do not entirely own and control. Running it on somebody else's machine is really just digital vandalism. It's a denial of service attack and you would be entirely responsible for whatever the outcome is. Preventing such attacks is relatively straightforward on Linux. There's a command called ulimit and if we run it with a dash u parameter, it will tell us how many new child processes are allowed for a user. On my Mac, it's about 10,000. On Linux, it's over 100,000. Either way, that's a sufficiently high limit that malicious actors can disrupt the system using it. The most basic protection is to use ulimit-u to limit each user to the actual number of processes that you believe to be reasonable. I just checked the Mac since it had the lowest limit to begin with, and I have about 600 active processes right now, so perhaps 2500 would be reasonable. Let's try it and see if it saves the system. First, I'll verify the old limit, which was 10,666. Now I'll use the ulimit command to change that number to 2500 and then run the command a third time to verify that the change has stuck. Next, I'll trigger a fork bomb. The system is clearly impacted, but this 20 core Mac Ultra only shoots up to about 70% of total usage, and this means there are enough CPU cycles to allow me, as a sysadmin, to now intervene. 
I can bring up another shell and then use the kill all command to terminate all ZSH processes. It's actually ZSH instead of bash because ZSH is now the default shell on Mac OS, but they're so similar that they behave the same with a fork bomb. So pretend it's bash. The same approach can be used on Linux as well. The only compromise is that you are, of course, limiting all users to whatever settings you impose here. For the more advanced Linux user, though, check out cgroups, which would allow you to get more granular control of such limits on who they impact specifically. Under Windows, it's more complicated. The plumbing is all there, it's just not exposed in a helpful way. In fact, I know it can be done because I did it a long time ago. I limited the system to some very small set of processes for parts of Windows activation so that if a crack did emerge and you broke out of the activation system into Windows, the system that resulted wouldn't be very useful. I did it all with standard API calls, but as to how I did it, well, discretion is still the better part of Valor, so I have to leave that one to the viewer as an exercise. In summary, then, a fork bomb is a type of denial of service attack in which a process repeatedly replicates itself, creating a large number of child processes that overwhelm the system and cause it to become unstable and or crash. In my testing, only Windows can actually survive and come back from a fork bomb, but ironically, it is also the only one of the major three that I could not find a way to proactively protect. If, along the way, you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving it a like and subscribing to my channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.